And thank you very much for joining us once again on PM Express. Uh, my guest tonight is a man who has been at the helm of managing affairs when it comes to the agri sector, one of the most important sectors of our economy. And as you know, uh, always a key subject anytime uh, the, the economy is struggling, you have to talk about the, the agri sector. And he has been managing this for a while. He led the uh, groundbreaking uh, policy, the plant for food and jobs. And he's my guest tonight on PM Express. Dr. Owusu Fria Koto is my guest. Thank you, sir, for your time once again <laughs> on PM Express. Um, I, I noticed today uh, there that um, smallholder farmers are getting some benefits uh, in the short term. And, and I want to start from there because we are finally possibly going to get a planting gun that will be assemb assembling uh, equipment for smallholder farmers. How are we funding that? Well, this, this is a facility from the Exim Bank of India <coughs> to the government of Ghana to a tune of something like 35 million US dollars to set up this uh, assembly plant near Kumasi, uh, closer to Ejusu to be exact. And it's one of its kind because first time any attempt has been made to assemble agricultural equipment in Ghana. And it is all part of the uh, pursuit of planting for food and jobs to introduce machinery into Ghanaian agriculture at a smallholder level as a way of improving the productivity of these farmers and to give us more food security. So when it's done, what will, what will happen? We're going to be assembling what, what type of equipment exactly? Well, small tractors, uh, backhoes and other implements. Um, it also generates local participation because some of the smaller units will be subcontracted to local uh, companies uh, in Kokompe uh, uh, and uh, Swami magazine and places like that. So it's, it's all good to be generating uh, local uh, employment. So the farmers can get this, they buy it or government is going to facilitate a certain arrangement? At the moment, we, all the machinery we bring into this country, the Akufuado government decided that they were going to subsidize at 40%. Okay. So 40%, which is quite a substantial amount. Uh, once it's being assembled here, it means the parts, we'll bring the parts in um, and then uh, uh, assemble them. Uh, for distribution to the farmers in farmer groups because in some cases you know smallholders are, are small two three four five acres they can't afford to buy you know, no matter how small a tractor is so it will be for group farming and that is one area that we have a whole uh, uh, department to organize organizing farmers into groups and a nucleus farmer commercial farmer around whom are uh, for other farmers, smaller ones, from 15 to as many as a thousand uh, smallholder farmers, so that everything uh, comes in a group. They buy, they purchase in a group. Uh, they 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 hire these services to themselves to to pay for the credit that they have. All those kinds of schemes will come into play. Okay. And of course, we're not leaving our commercial farmers because in Ghana, if we're 20 acres, we are commercial farmer. So if, uh, 20 acres, 30 acres, 50 acres, 200 acres. They will, be, they, they will have a chance to, to buy their machinery. Okay, so they will buy, but the, for smallholder, you, yes, you we will we give them some credit them. and for okay. some facility. When, when, are you, when, are you, when you hope for this to be done? Well, uh, the Minister of Finance just signed this agreement last week uh, with the Exim Bank officials here in Accra. And we are hoping that now that everything has been done, before the end of this year, the construction will start. And definitely by next year, See, next farming season 2023, there should be some outflows uh, to support the farmers. Okay, so this is a, it's a 24 million dollars. Yes. Um, is it a grant? Is it a loan? It's no, it's a loan. It's, it's a, a long-term loan. loan, very, very soft, you know, uh, five-year uh, free of uh, payment and then subsequently, you know, one point something percent and all that. Very, very uh, favorable times for us. And I guess mechanizing our agri has been a major challenge for all agri ministers, including yes, yourselves. That's right. Um, how do you hope that this may go a long way to deal with the problem, where we still re rely heavily on, if it's not raining, you're struggling, and well, then people are still using their you know, no, traditional the, holes the and The thing is that because of the higher rate of rural urban migration, 
labor is becoming shorter and shorter. So you need mechanization to replace labor. Mm -hmm. And uh, that would be of great help to, in order to sustain the expansion of these small holders. Some start with two acres, they end up with 15, 20 acres. And uh, by which time they employ maybe 50 workers, especially at the peak when harvesting comes on. Mm -hmm. So if, if they are able to mechanize the activities, they don't need that much labor. And labor is becoming very expensive. So uh, it goes into the cost of production. So if you can reduce cost of labor and you can replace it with uh, uh, machinery, uh, the profitability will be much higher for you. So that, that's the way forward. Mm -hmm. you, when, you, when you talk to your farmers, and I know yourself, you are, you are a farmer, have they come to embrace mechanized agriculture? I mean, oh, everybody is everybody is hungry for mechanized peasant farmers, yes, etc. Yeah, everybody. Uh, I mean, who who doesn't? You know, the arduous thing of going to the uh, to the fields at six o'clock in the mor in the morning in the tropical sun and staying there till two a.m. and so on, it's like a punishment. So <laughs> if you can relieve the drudgery, take the drudgery out. It encourages. Young, m many more young people to go in it, mm. in there and, and make money. I mean, it's amazing. These uh, vegetable farmers uh, with uh, one acre or less can make more than a, 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 a director here in this ministry does in a, in a month. I mean, it can be very lucrative, you know, except that the drudgery is something that some of them find very difficult to cope with. But once we are able to mechanize uh, uh, a lot of the activities on the farm it makes it easy for entry you mm -hmm. know and especially with the kind of generous credit facilities the uh, subsidies that uh, this government is given for agricultural machine you mean the indian government well, uh, the, uh, uh, no, apart, no, from, no. apart from the 24 million, the yes. other uh, they, they, uh, the Brazilian go government, uh, the Brazilian government is also giving us facility uh, for to import farm machinery uh, and processing facilities for our farmers and for our uh, processes. So, they, they, it's not just the Indian government; other governments uh, also. Uh, so. Is this uh, Dr. Wusefri's initiative? I mean, uh, is this something well, that... Well, some of them, yes. I mean, for instance, SAPIP in the northern region, which is an offshoot of planting for food and jobs. I had to go to Abidjan to sit down with uh, uh, Dr. Adeshina, the president of the African Development Bank, to convince him that we need to have something like that, where we are turning semi-commercial farmers into commercial farms. And it's been a very successful... Uh, scheme that we are expanding now. So people with 10 acres, 20 acres, uh, the, the scheme will come and expand their acreages for them, supply them with seed fertilizer, and then they pay back in kind. And it's very, very popular. We can't even cope with, with that. So no, I mean, there are all kinds of ways uh, by which planting for food and jobs is doing a great job. And you know, uh, the chief statistician, uh, the government statistician came up with the figures for GDP 2020. 21 and up to then even the minister the minister of finance was estimating that growth 2021 was expected to be 4.4 at the end of the day when they put all the figures together it was 5.4 percent mm. and where was this growth coming from from agriculture agriculture last year grew 8.4 percent in agriculture which of the subsectors were driving that crops crops grew at 8.9 percent which has not, not happened for many years. So there's something really happening to Ghanaian agriculture, and we should be commended for that. Okay, and, and, and this factory, just a final one, will be in Kumasi? Yes, near Kumasi, I just saw. Okay, it's, uh, I just saw is right there. Yes, okay. yes, yeah, that's so right, so yes, before. yes, yes. I mean, and this is your home region? Yes, it's my home region, yes. yes. So you must be very proud that it's... Well, uh, I'm, I'm, it's I'm, all farmers in Ghana will benefit. It's not only Ashanti region farmers, yeah. for goodness sake. I mean. The people in the Upper West, Upper East, Volta region, Western region, all farmers will benefit. Mm. In, in, in understanding 18 months, the, the first structures should be ready? Yes, yes, yes. That's what I'm saying. That, uh, it will be, they should be ready. Some of it should be ready for next year, 2023, uh, production, farm production. So we are on course. Okay. On course. I mean, talking about the uh, plant food and jobs, um, if I ask you to rate it, because it's been five years since you started, yes. right? It's been yes. yeah. So five years is a good time to, I guess, look yes. back. Yeah. In, in percentage terms, where would you, what, what, how would you rate it? Its performance in percentage I think, terms. I think that in. How would you score it? I would score it hundred percent. 
because no, no, no because you know why? Mm -mm. The, the, the it's impacting, changing psychology of people towards agriculture, attitude towards agriculture. You cannot put a value on it. You have to go to the field to see the number of young people, professional people, who are now coming into into the field. Yesterday, um, on Saturday, within a matter of two hours, I met two farmers who are medical doctors who have resigned and are into agriculture on a full time doing coconut plantation with all kinds of uh, products from coconut. Very interesting. And the other one was with, with his mother and family uh, in near Asamankasi, planting 35 acres of maize, cassava, and so on. Is it Dr. Samen's company? No, no, no. This is a medical, medical doctor. Yes, yeah. yes. So within two, within two hours, I met two medical doctors who had resigned and were permanently into agriculture. And that phenomenon is all over the country. Last year, when we went to Ejura, I had a, a forum for farmers. And this lady stood up and was saying, look, now it's not only us, teachers, medical doctors, nurses, everybody uh, uh, coming into, into the field to, to plant. And it is. It is the, the contribution of uh, planting for food and jobs in changing the psychology of, 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 of the attitude of people towards farming. And a lot of people are, are moving into agriculture. But, but in reality, I, when you say 100%, mm -hmm. you, you, you're being serious about rating the entire. Yes. You, you focus on the psychology, but what about the actual oh, creating the actual. for food yes. and, and jobs? jobs. Yes. So in there, yes. you told us how we can measure you. Yes. We can measure you based on the food you produce mm -hmm. and the jobs you create. Right. On those two mm -hmm. variables, mm -hmm. would you still score yourself 100%? Without planting for food and jobs, if we were going at a pace that we uh, took over from the previous government, growth per year had come down to less than 1% per year. Per year. We managed to swing it up, as I was saying, about from the government statistics, which came out last month, that agricultural growth in one year was 8.4 percent, and and for in the, an industry which depends upon nature and so on, that's uh, fantastic, and it's very obvious. You see, I'm the chairman of ECOWAS Ministers for Food and Agriculture, because our president is the chairman of ECOWAS. Mm -hmm. And I've had two Zoom meetings with my colleagues uh, in the region. And that's where you come to see the impact of government policy, a Kufuado's policy of planting for food and jobs. We are far, far better off than, mo than oh, I don't even see which country. You know, when they're talking about their parameters and their variables, their constraints and the challenges they are facing, of course, we are facing challenges. Food prices are very high. And people sit in Accra and they say, oh, food prices are high because government has failed in this agricultural policy. That's a very simplistic view. I'm just coming after eight days in five uh, forest regions. There's a lot of food in, in, in the system. In the, in the enclave of um, uh, 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 um, uh, Bono East, Techiman going all the way to a giraffe in that enclave. Physically, we saw something like 25,000 metric tons of maize from last year's harvest packed there waiting for bias. <laughs> you know, so for me, if you say that uh, high prices of food and, and therefore the uh, policy has failed, you're, you're not being uh, realistic. Because there's food the stocks up there, and don't 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 forget. In the next one month, the first harvest of this year's 2022 will harvest will be coming on top of what is already there. So it's not a question of shortage of food. It's rather to do with the sharp increase in prices of basic items, uh, the cost of production, farm chemicals. Last year, farmers used to buy at 120 now, 400 Ghana cities, you can't even get to buy uh, uh, fertilizer. The same thing, uh, fuel prices are troubled, so moving the crop from the farm to the consuming uh, 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 markets is, is gone through the roof. But in terms of the, so on the farm itself, as I'm saying, people are still moving in into cultivating. I mean, the first five months, for instance, Eastern region, 
when you the statistics that was provided by our people there, five months January my, uh, to uh, January to May this year compared to last year, you see that there's there there's it's even gone up, and people think that oh because there's no um, uh, uh, fertilizer, so uh, farmers are closing down their production. No, that's not the case, and that's what I saw. The reaction of farmers to this shortage of inorganic fertilizer is to switch to organic fertilizer. Both uh, 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 liquid fertilizer, which you spray on the on the on the leaves, rather than putting the stolons under the, the the tree, and and other forms of fest, uh, uh, fertilizers that are organically ma manufactured is even better because yeah. then the environment is saved. Uh, we use. Uh, kinds of inputs uh, that we discard on the farms and in the urban areas to produce these uh, organic fertilizers. And we are encouraging farmers and we, we didn't need encouragement actually because what is happening is that they are going to looking for alternative cheaper sources of fertilizing their, their crops. I mean, having said that though, <coughs> you, you admit a, a hundred percent is almost divine. It, it's hundred percent is perfection. I mean, perfection is only attributable qualities well, of the divine and so far as I know Dr. Usufri is as human as me. Yeah, sure. The, the, no policy can be perfect. Yeah, yeah, but I you, mean, you, you admit that is yeah, yeah, look, you, you overstating give, it. You you will be giving your own marks, right? I'm giving my marks. Okay. So your your marks are as good as my marks. <laughs> but but, but no, no matter how well the policy is, you admit that it can be it can be perfect. They, of course, they, no. It cannot. So it, it, it can, can be, be perfect. Yes. It can be hundred percent. Well, I'm saying that the performance is hundred percent. The performance is hundred yes. <laughs> percent. What, what, what did you say to some of your friends mm -hmm. uh, who did research? I think this is uh, research that was done by uh, the Penal Farm Association, collaboration of Oxfam, Private Enterprise Foundation, and others, who said that the findings show that about and this is a couple of years back. Uh, they found that the findings of the research show that there is a problem with the distribution chain because more work has not been done to market the produce. Like you did a lot in terms of import, but in terms of the looking at, okay, so once we produce, what do we do with the produce? They, they found that there's a break in that chain. What do you say to that? No, so it means that the farmers are, are landed with their stocks, with nobody buying it. Is that what you're saying? Well, that's what the research is suggesting. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm using just common sense to that, say that. That, 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 that we are producing but, but if a there's, lot. If there's a break, it means that farmers are stuck with their stocks. Nobody's buying. Isn't that why they are taking it and smuggling it to other countries? No, no, they're because not they smuggling. No, no. Of course, you produce. If you live on an island of uh, shortage and you are producing surplus, obviously you attract people to come. And for the farmers, it's good because it may provide an automatic market for them. The only problem is that they are, they are short of the processing, the secondary tertiary stages, which is farmers buying the maize to feed their, 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 their poultry, for instance, or soya processors buying to process from the farmers okay. and so on. But otherwise, that, that really shows you that the, 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 the break that you're talking about doesn't exist. Also otherwise, why, why, would, why would they be talking about a break when you're also talking about people smuggling? Mm. Also, they, also, they say that it show that 17% of the total farmer population receive fertilizers and seeds, right? 17%. Under, under plant food and jobs policy, while the remaining 82% did not get in, in, the, form, in the, the form of support they wanted or the No, but what, what, what is the basis for those statistics? Well, so that, that I mean, is what I'm they saying found that, No, no, they, 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 that couldn't be true. Mm -hmm. Because the beneficiaries of planting for food and jobs, we started with 200,000 farmers as a target for 2017. By 2020, that figure had gone up to 1.6 million farmers. And you are not telling me that that's 15% of farmers in Ghana. No, I mean, some of these things, please, don't just, uh, <laughs> you know, just take it down and go down, it down without questioning the basis. We have the status to show that we're able, the beneficiaries in the 16 regions, 1.6 something million farmers, which was the highest. And how many farmers are there in Ghana for you to constitute 15%? No, mm. oh, <laughs> some of these things, please, let's, let's, let's carry on without mentioning these because we have we are the custodians generators of data in the agriculture sector 
whole agricultural sector. That is my brief. So if somebody sits in uh, Kwanguma and says, oh, this district, this is what we found, and therefore that's so for the whole country, you will be making a mistake. The minister has been touring the country. I'm going to take a break. Whether it's, I want to, I want to hear his, his, the stories he's picked up when he traveled. I've heard uh, stories from, uh, positive stories uh, from some of the people he had met. But I wanted his own assessment of what he found. But we'll talk about the food prices too that we know had gone up. We'll talk about the fertilizer situation. And we'll talk about um, a lot more with the agri sector that I know many of you have been talking about. Uh, stay with me after the break. We'll hear what the minister found when he told the country. And thanks for staying with me. My guest is still the Agri Minister, um, who is obviously has a lot on his plate all the time, especially this time when um, there's a lot happening in the world that has led to uh, soaring food prices. The Agri is every country is talking about how to feed its population in the midst of the crisis, and that's why we are talking to him uh, in the midst of the global food crisis that had been triggered largely by what is happening in in Ukraine and elsewhere. And so we'll talk to him about how Ghana is managing, but. Uh, look, you've traveled recently across the country. Um, what did you find? First of all, we took eight days off from our air conditions, air condition offices, with all my directors, to five regions in the forest belt. This we do every year to come abreast with the problems that farmers are facing, that agro processors are facing so that we can factor that into our policy when we are making policy. What problem did you discover then? The first thing we discovered was that the rains have been good. The rains have been excellent this year. To the extent that all along your left, right, wherever you went, you could see that the plants are very healthy and are re really almost on the verge of being harvested. That's maize and the other tree crops, cassava, plantain, all over the place. And wherever we went in the five regions, they recognized that indeed, the rains this year, major season, has been excellent. So it has encouraged a lot of farmers to plant. Normally, because of uh, the climate change, rains in the major season are very erratic. So farmers have learned over the years to plant more during the minor season which is August, September, rather than uh, March, April, May. But this year, because the rains have been consistent and has been good, a lot of farmers are out there very, very busy. The only problem that they have is to do with the shortage of fertilizers. Everywhere we went, we realized that is the case. But the farmers are not sitting there waiting for help from heaven. Two things in their reaction that we found one, that if there's shortage of inorganic fertilizer and prices have gone up three or four times within a year, they found it too expensive to buy. So we reverted to organic fertilizer. And organic fertilizer in terms of uh, uh, foliar fertilizer, which is the liquid that is sprayed on the leaves of the plants, whether it's rice or, or, or maize or soya. And then secondly, the manure, which is uh, animal manure mixed with some kinds of uh, 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 wooden manure, you know, uh, all kinds of things, byproducts of sawdust saw and all kinds of things which they are applying. So that is the first reaction that they are, they, they are now moving quickly into organic fertilizer in a way that I never expected to happen. Farmers are very conservative. They are not used to a product, they won't use it. 
And so we were thinking that we would uh, have to convince them, retune our extension officers and so on to persuade them. They're not waiting for anything. But that's because the fertilizer prices have gone to the roof. Yes, and you, in many cases you can't even find it. That's how serious the shortage is. So that's But what about the plant of food and jobs subsidized ones? Well, I mean, he, well, he said, if you don't have the product, how do you subsidize? You subsidize a product when it's on the market. If it's not there, what do you subsidize? Okay, so so are you subsidizing the organic fertilizer too? Or are yes, you providing yes. them yourself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. We, we, we've been doing business with 18 companies supplying organic fertilizers to us in the five years of planting for food. This is jobs. imported organic fertilizer? Well, some of them are imported. Others are locally made. And the, those locally made, the, the one with very industrious uh, program for expansion is Zoom Lion. They have this plant in Accra here. The Accra Which was recently. Compost, yeah, recently yes, uh, that's right. And then Kumasi, they have a compost plant. And that is has the state-of-the-art uh, machinery from Germany. And the amount of uh, compost that they are producing is, is incredible. Mm -hmm. And because of the demand, their order books are just by the every day doubling, doubling, doubling. Does so, the individual farmers? Yes, yes. Are, are making I, I'm, demands I'm making demands, yes. What about the for government the, um, a, a contribution to that, purchase for the farmers? That yeah, yeah, but, but that's what I'm saying, mm. that we, we have a, 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 a contract with 18 of them. Mm. So they, those that we have come, NPK, they, it's not there, so they are not, produ they are not supplying anything because they can't find it. And those that have the organic fertilizer that we have contrast with, they are, they, are, they, are, they are overbooked. To the extent that even the Kumasi Compost Factory is now putting a second line, a new machinery, new building to, to augment because they are overwhelmed with the demand. And that's how interesting the whole thing has become. So that's the first point, switching from inorganic to organic fertilizer. Second point, and it's very interesting that they are now moving away from the, you know, the organic crops, the crops that require fertilizers, to those that don't require fertilizers. That's the, the, the tubers. So we're talking about yams, uh, um, plantain, cassava, and all those. That you, you can see that the information that was given to us, the data, there is a, a, a switch in the acreages of these as opposed to the, the grains which require uh, uh, fertilizer. So very interesting that farmers are adjusting to the new situation, which means that of course with the good rains, we are going to have more of these crops in terms of, I'm talking about the, the, the tubers, you know? And then there's also the entry of new entrants coming into the market. So where there's a, a um, a shortage of fertilizer and the farmers, existing farmers may be uh, cutting back or not be able to maintain the same amount of acreages. New entrants are coming in, so they are coming in to add to the acreages. So these are the ways in which farmers are adjusting to the new situation of acute shortage of inorganic fertilizer. Mm. So the, the shortage, many have said, and uh, peasant farmers have said that the shortage, the fertilizer challenge, mm -hmm was definitely going to affect food production. They've actually predicted we're going to have a food crisis on our hands and a food shortage on our hands. They've, every year they've said the same thing and it never happened. So I'm saying that in the enclave of Tachiman, physically in the markets, we saw something like 25,000 metric tons of maize from last year's harvest. So where's the shortage they are talking about? So are you saying that we have, we have enough food? Of course. But if that's the case, how do you explain the high food prices? That is, that is because there are a, a external factors. The, the troubling of a, a petrol, which means that moving the produce from the farm gate to the market more than trebles, okay? The cost of production on the farm. If you, you used to do 120 CDs per bag and now you are doing 400 CDs per bag, you don't expect that the farmer will price it the same as before. So all these are factors outside the domain which are having the impact. It doesn't mean that the food is not there. I'm saying that I've seen with my experts in uh, that little enclave, something like 25,000, it's not in the warehouse, it's in the market. But that's anecdotal, it's not enough to tell the full no, story. No, but, but it, it tells you something. This is the biggest grain market you can find in, in, in Ghana and some say West Africa. 
And if you can find that kind of stock sitting there waiting for buyers, what does it tell you? And not to mention Tamale and the other places. I'm just talking about that enclave in Bono East, extending to northern part of Ashanti, Ejura, that, that area alone. Mm. So there's food. The fact that the prices have gone up are external to, this is why I'm, I referred you to the statistics on the growth in agriculture last year. 8.4 percent. External, you mentioned external being the chemicals, production uh, cost of chemicals mm -hmm. on farm, making cost of production much higher than before, and also cost of transport, three, three uh, petrol, uh, 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 diesel, petrol have gone up by three times. So of course, cost of, cost of transporting to the, and don't forget, the price in the urban market are um, two components, the cost of production on the farm and the haulage to the, uh, the urban markets. And in both cases, prices have gone through the roof. So that is what is causing the, 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 the high price of food. But the food is there. I saw it myself. And this is at the, at the end of the season. This is closing stocks from 2021. And in the next one month, we are going to have the harvest for this year coming in again. Yes. So, so, so the supply situation is very, very healthy. So, so we, we are yet to see the harvest. That will really tell us what is happening with the effect of the challenges we've had with the fertilizer. So it's, it, it's premature, as you know, to say that we, we have enough food. No, we, the, yeah, the, the harvest that, will tell us. No, no, no. Listen, I'm saying that the driving force behind all this is the distribution of, of the rainfall. And the, this year, the major season rainfall has been excellent. And the meteorologists are telling us that it's going to continue for the rest of the year. So you're expecting a bumper harvest, I guess that's what you're saying. Well, I'm not talking about bumper. Well, what I'm saying is that we will have more than enough to eat and to feed our stock, our livestock, except that we do it at a higher price, which is nothing to do with us because of these externalities. That's what I'm saying. If that's I, I hope I hope you are following. You, 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 I hope you are, you are following what I'm saying. So price is going to be high. You expect because of external factors, yes. but you have you say you the have food will be there. You have you have enough food to feed everybody. But yes. if that's the case, why are you then placing a brand and extending it on grains, for example? No, because of specific. Isn't that an admission no, that no, no, no. But if, if, but if, no, no. But if <laughs> if the food wasn't there, how, how would I stop the ban? What was the need? As you are saying, but if we have enough, <laughs> if we have enough, then the status quo should be should be should be should be prevail. Which yeah, is yeah, but this is why we the excess. No, we are responding to uh, um, stakeholders, poultry farmers, who say that they don't have enough for their uh, poultry. But it, therein lies a the confirmation that yeah. there's a challenge with the quantities we are producing. No, 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 no. The, if they're not the having fact, enough, listen, then there's I had something a, wrong I had with two the and a half hours with the farmers in Doma Ingro. At the end of the meeting, we all came to an understanding. It's not that the food is not there, it's expensive. If your cost of production for maintaining 100 heads of chicken is say 20 cities, and then suddenly the cost doubles to 40 cities. So the quantities that you can buy is halved, okay? You cannot use that half to feed the hundred uh, chickens. So it will mean that you have to dispose of the 50 chickens so that whatever your money can buy can feed the rest. And that's what was, is happening. The farmers who used to have 100,000 heads of uh, chicken are now doing 30, 40, because what, that is what their money their working capital can hold. So they're buying saying, less because of the cost? Oh, of course. Uh, the costs have gone up three, three times, as we, we all admit, that f the prices have gone up. So, but why did you then stop the export? The, the, no, the, no, the, the no, export I'll come to that. The point I'm making is this, that because of that, it's rather the banks, the commercial banks, who are dealing with these farmers, who should know that they have their customers whose cost of production have gone up, and therefore to support them with credits which the banks are not doing. You say you're going to compel them to do it. To well, do I'm saying, no, let's get it first of all, that they are not giving them the credits for them to maintain the heads of poultry that they have. So they are having to cut back by selling part of their, their, 
their chicken so that whatever money their working capital can buy will be able to feed and that is the phenomenon going on and they were thinking that is a fault of government but when we went there and sat there and explained to them the whole situation they understood at the end of the meeting there was a very uh, uh, cordial uh, departure between us and them it understood that is the banks which have failed them because if you're a poultry farmer professional poultry farmer you farm 10 15 years obviously you have a relationship with the bank and if your situation has changed your cost of production has gone up they should support you but they are not they rather give these monies to these women going to China to buy these cheap stuff to come and sell okay so at the, at the background we explain and we, we explain to them and in that way, we are not even saying that we haven't spoken to the banks. We've been speaking to the banks. But the banks to respond to government policies also. But right? they are not responding this, this, this time. But why is the government policy to encourage banks to give out? To, no, to we give don't out. have any government policy on that. This, this is monetary policy. Interest rates are this and that and that. But in places like India, they have a law which says that for every 100 rupees that you lend, 20 rupees should go to agriculture. And this is what we are, we are looking at. In fact, I've had yeah, a meeting. Yeah, would you explain that alternative? Yeah, yeah, I've had a meeting with the Indian High Commission in my office today, this morning, for him to give me that legislation so that we can look at it and adapt it to our Ghanaian situation and with the help of the Attorney General, draft something for Cabinet to approve to go to Parliament. So in essence, what you're saying is that if you, if you pass this to Parliament, mm -hmm. the banks will be compelled to give a portion of their loans yes. For agricultural, for agricultural purposes. Yes. Farmers, processors, and all those in the value chain. Okay. In India, you say it's what, 5%? You no, know, 20%. 20%. Yes. That's significant. Yeah. You're looking, years. At, you're looking at the same range? Well, yeah. I don't know. But definitely the principle is that if persuasion fails, then you use the law. But we, we, we run a market economy. Yes. I mean, this is a new patriotic yeah, party. Yeah, that yeah, is the yeah. property only one yes, that, but, that believes but, you know, in, there, there, there's in no, the free market. There's no the banks there, must decide about themselves. Yeah, but they are not helping. I mean, there's no free economy than Indian economy. It's become part of their culture. And this is why Indian, Indian agriculture is booming. It's now the biggest exporter of food in the world, India. Many years ago, donors had to gather in Paris, London, New York to pledge food for India because millions of people died every year with hunger. That's not, that's not a, a generation. And now they become a major player of agricultural exports. And all because of all these legislation, we have to learn from other, other people's experience and not just sit, sit there and twiddle our, our, our fingers because we, we talk nicely to people and they don't listen. You just sit there when you have an instrument by which you could, and, and it's a good look. Have you met the banks at all? Oh, yes. In fact, have you about told them your, about your concerns? Oh, listen, about uh, September last year, the President of the Republic invited all heads of bank to lunch in Jubilee House with me present, Minister of Finance present, the governor of the bank present. And I addressed them about the issue, that this government is doing so much for the farmers. They just need support of credit in order that they can push the, the whole agenda. We, we, we spoke. And individually, I mean, I've been talking to my managing directors of banks, inviting them to my office, because cases come up and farmers come to me. Oh, they've been looking for credit. They've given their collaterals. The banks are not doing this. And once in a while, I call them, and they come. And I said, I said, look, what, what is this? And, and we are not- And you as well. Excuse? No, okay, then we look at the person who is my manager, and they go, and then they, 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 they try and do something. You know, but it, it shouldn't be an individual thing. I'm not uh, uh, a negotiator between far, individual farmers. and There should be an institutional arrangement that everybody knows the role that they are playing. And I think the banks have a big role to play because now the stakes are so high, we have a much higher output of agriculture and it needs to, to sustain it. You need the, to, to oil that engine with agricultural credit, and, and it, it's not there. But, but the banks are very rational economic entities, and it's, it's very likely, in fact, that could be the case, that the agri sector in Ghana is not that lucrative. It's not, it doesn't pay. But, but I'm saying that. So that's why they're not putting well, their money there. So I, you have I, to make I, it pay first. I'm, I'm saying and that. And I'm saying that. Pay, no, no, I'm saying that it pays. But the banks disagree with you. That's why uh, they're not putting well, their money well, there. Well, whatever it is, you may be a free market uh, person, but I'm saying that in this particular case, they had to be 
uh, uh, they had to be persuaded in a very nice way to, to do the right thing. Because government is doing it. We are subsidizing fertilizers and inputs and all these things. And the results are, are there to see. Uh, maize production has gone from 1.8 to 3.2 million last year. We expect that it will go up further. And this is why we have these surpluses that these foreign and uh, neighboring countries are coming to, to pick their surpluses and, and all that. So there is a lot of evidence to show that planting for food and just have been extremely successful in transforming, but transformation is, on a, is a process, see? So to sustain that kind of growth, you need the oil. To, for the engine, which is agricultural credit. And that we have to get the banks to come in. My, my guest is still the Agri Minister. When I return from this break, uh, we'll talk a bit more about, about grains. Grains is a central part of the, of the food, food and jobs policy. Um, we would, we'll look at that. And the government had decided recently to extend the ban on, on grains export. We'll ask him why that is. Koto, uh, who has been uh, really very busy traveling the country um, on the back of the global food crisis uh, that every country is having to deal with. Ghana is having to deal with their own. And, and Doc, we, we, we've talked about Ghana's challenge, Ghana's share in this crisis that the globe is seeing with food prices uh, going up. You've talked about your tour. One of the key things you admit is prices have gone up on the market. Yeah. Food prices yeah. are expensive. Well, food, food is available. Um, what are you doing about it, by the way? The, the prices of yes. the food on the market? You see, um, the information we gathered on this trip, it shows that prices at the farm gate have gone up, but not as much as the prices in the, at the retail end. So the problem is to do with in between, as freight. So Cabinet set up a committee, uh, referred this to economic management team, Minister of Transport, is supposed to be talking, well, has actually met the freight uh, uh, associations. Um, I have identified the specific areas where different types of food are normally traded around the country. I've given that information to him. Based on that, he has met the unions of uh, transporters, identifying which of them are applying this route for this crop and this and that and that. We are, this week we are meeting them again, we are engaging them to try and impress upon them that what they are charging in terms of freight is just too high. That if you take account of petrol and uh, car maintenance and all those things, it is really not what it should be. The, and therefore the possibility that we could subsidize what they are doing, for instance, in order to bring prices down. Uh, by giving them uh, coupons or something. The transporters. The, the transporters. You know, specifically selecting some of them, giving them coupons as a way of subsidizing, bringing down their so costs. So what is the coupon? Fewer coupons. Fewer coupons or something, you know. But then the issue is to do with the next batch of people, the market quiz. You know, in situations like that, people exploit the situation. So it may not all be to do with the transporters, but also the market queens who actually control uh, what comes into the market and who gets what. So that is another area that we well, want to engage. That, that well, part, that, that, that part, local government is in charge of all markets. So through the Ministry of Local Governments, we are hoping that we'll be able to talk to the market queens about the situation, tell them, give them the figures, touch your mind. Uh, maize is how much is costing at the market, but yet uh, at the retail end here is about four times, and it's no, you know, some 
have some engagement mm. to try a dialogue to be able to identify where exactly the problem is and for us to put our finger on it to be able to deal with it so at this stage we are still exploring mm -hmm. but the big thing uh, now is that uh, time is moving in our way because seasonally uh, normally seasonally march april may june at the highest when prices are very high then after the harvest yes then when, when the harvest start coming in prices start going down again so we expect to see especially with a good crop that we've seen in the field at least in the forest belt we expect to see a decline in food prices in the next two two months or how so. significant do you expect well that, that one i cannot tell at this stage but definitely if i had gone to uh, like i did uh, 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 we found in 2020 when there was a sh shortage um, of uh, when the crop was actually bent more or less because i remember 2020 before the election i had to travel from kumasi to ejua to go and meet a, a, a parliamentary candidate for a discussion and something that i had to do from Mampong all the way to a dry, it was all brown. The crop had just been damaged beyond repair. So you knew that there's something wrong, and really something was wrong. That's why we had the following year a spike in the prices, and now they, they followed by this war, a further spike, and it's, it's going up. But this time, what I saw is all green, fresh. Uh, uh, growth at, uh, all around us, and the, the farmers themselves admitted that oh, this year the rains have been excellent. So, so your prediction of prices going down will largely because we expect mm -hmm. good harvest. Yes, I mean, but the factors that predominantly had contributed for the huge prices. Yes, will, uh, will still will be there. Yes. Yes. Exactly. So, I mean, yeah, the so, prices, so the, the if prices fall, they won't fall to the levels of pre nineteen twenty. You understand because of these increases, but definitely yeah, it's not going to keep on going up like it did January, February, March, which led to an increase in inflation and so on. It, if it's not stabilizing, at least it will start coming down, but not at the rate that it will come down to pray. Because now we've moved on to a, a different plane altogether yeah. in terms of the cost structures. So you, you are not going to see a, a dramatic fall to pre 2020 levels, no. But at least it will be better than what we've gone through with a, this dry season that we are coming out of. Let's talk about an intervention that you were compelled to do. And recently, mm -hmm. I know you've extended the ban on mm -hmm. export of grain. Temporal ban. Temporal, Temporal ban. Yes. <laughs> Why did you have to extend the ban? Well, because, you know, um, we're responding to the poultry farmers that um, they couldn't find maize soya on the market and at the same time so we started with ba uh, stopping uh, soya but from your own doc documentary two weeks ago that there was a huge legal thing going up uh, yeah. up north up north yes people okay. were still smuggling it yeah although the ban was but but, but now we formed a committee uh, a sub cabinet committee to look at that in terms of its implementation so I'm very confident that that will be working now. Is that an admission that before mm -hmm. the implementation was not in tip-top form? Yeah, it looks like that. It, it's, it's obviously, I mean, from the reports the that we were getting, yes. you know, because really this is a security matter. It's not for the Ministry of Agriculture to be at the border to stop people from... They are border guards, they are police, they are soldiers, they are uh, BDI, intelligence, all those things. Yeah, they're coming together. So we are working with them, local government and everything, to make sure that it's implemented. And we said temporal ban because to give flexibility to this government, to see, because don't forget, the big factor there is the farmer. If we stop the flow outside and the stocks accumulate at the farmer's level and you're having high spoilage and losing money, obviously the following year you're not going to put in a uh, similar so we have to protect the farmer as well with an eye on what they uh, they have their prices and so on uh, and the other instrument that we are bringing is the grain development authority which is going to parliament this week 
It's gone through a pilot, through cabinet, cabinet committee, cabinet, and now the attorney general was preparing the bill. We've dealt with the attorney general over the weekend. Their staff and my staff, they sat and they've concluded everything about the bill. The attorney general has to sign and send it to uh, to the Speaker of Parliament for it to become uh, part of the work for this meeting. Mm -hmm. So we are hoping that it will be passed. And the passage of that bill will really strengthen our hand because then it will give an authority which can raise money against its own balance sheet. Uh, we are giving them, we'll be handing over to them the 80 warehouses that we have built, 1,000 metric ton warehouses, and seed fund to be able to hopefully participate in the purchases at this coming harvest when we know, normally prices are at their lowest you know put them into these warehouses and similar then they, to the way cocoa bodies function yeah but cocoa yes i mean you could say that but this is this is a this is a internal trading okay. you know cocoa board is external trading okay they buy it from the farmers store it and they ship it out mm -hmm. but this one is to to store and release to stakeholders like poultry farmers and so on at the appropriate time when we're uh, doing the dry season, when prices are high or availability is short. So that will bring about, and then also the quality. They will be responsible to maintain a certain quality of the commodity. And, and all those things that have to be done as a grains authority, mm -hmm. they'll be, they will have the, the bill has the, has given the, the authority the power to do that. You said that the um, ban, the, the temporary ban, you mm -hmm. called it. So if it's temporal, what, what, what do you want to see before you lift the ban? What would it take? Well, we have to look at the size of the crop and all those things. That is if local production yes. increases? Yes. Okay. Beyond a certain limit, uh, if it increases, then we have to lift the ban. Okay. And then bring it back. In. But then, of course, it will be taken over by the Grains Development Authority anyway. Mm. That job will not, no longer be the ministry. It will be for the authority to determine uh, the size of the crop. We, and, and can I put it things. to you that that statement is an admission that we, we are not producing enough of grains to feed the local market? Which local market? The entire local market, including the poultry farmers. No, but if we do enough of that, then... No, no, no but that's what, this what I'm saying, that... At the, at the end of the season, the closing stocks that we saw, I mean, 25,000 metric tons in, physically in the market waiting to be bought, it's not a small quantity, you know? Mm. It's, it's quite a substantial amount. And in one enclave. So we don't know what is happening in the other, say, the northern sector. And that is a major grain uh, producing area. Because if the condition for lifting the ban is improve local production, it's, it's No, no, it's suggest. not improve, it's improving local supplies. Yeah, but that will come from how much you're producing. Then you can supply enough to, yes, to feed the but, market. Yes, but it also depends upon the evacuation and all those things, which will come under the authority. See, at the moment, all these access to the areas, farmers are complaining, oh, the, the, the bridge is broken here, or the, the, they won't even come because the, the, the access will get broken and, and all those things. So in terms of evacuation and all those things, these all add up to the supply situation. You may have stocks which are locked up somewhere in uh, OT region, for instance. Occasionally you hear that yams are there in, in hundreds of thousands of tubers, but there's no access because the little break there is broken or something has happened and, and people can't evacuate. You know? So we have all these kinds mm, but, but of that, But that's not the main problem, is it? The main problem no. is that we are not producing enough locally now in grains. Why do you say that? If, we, if we're not producing enough, there, be, there shouldn't be any stock in the market. There is stock, obviously. Oh, yeah, that's what I'm saying. There is stock. Yes. It's, it's whether it's enough why not, for, why for not? the entire yes. needs that we currently have. Yeah, yeah, of course. It's, it's enough. Including it's a, the, including it's the cost. Farmers. This is what I'm saying. That is the cost of the stock that we are talking about. The price, which has gone beyond their normal levels because of the, the, what is happening in the world. Mm. Okay, so it's a price. It's not that physically. There, there's, you know, I'm saying I was going out there, thinking that oh, I wouldn't see any stock. But there's uh, stock, and you ask them, you, you uh, everywhere you go, oh, no, there's uh, there's food here. There's mm. there's food. Have the poultry farmers now have getting access adequate access to the the grains that they complain about after you met them now? No, where's the money? So they, they, still don't they need the working capital to buy. Okay. 
It, that's, it, a, that's a point. I see, know the long term is to deal with this legislation to the banks, but in the short term, any help to the farmers? Well, we just have to. No, I mean, we, 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 we don't have anything in our budget to support poultry farmers or any, any other farmers. And you know that because of the fiscal situation, we've had to cut back 30% on everybody's budget. So You've cut back 30% of yours? I didn't cut it. I mean, I know. The, I mean, everybody ministry, has to. The yeah. Ministry of yeah. Finance yeah. has cut yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I, I just wonder how that is affecting the agric ministry, though. With every well, we are carrying on. I mean, we all understand the situation that we find ourselves in, and we make do with whatever we can. That's all. I mean, you, you, you can't just sit there and say, oh, my budget is cut, therefore uh, I'm, I'm folded up my arms. No, no. We are not the kind of people to do that, to give in at all. And we are really fighting very well. We are working seven days a week in the ministry to make sure that farmers are well catered for. Mm. Yeah. Uh, finally, what's your own growth prediction for the next year and the year after that? Your growth, growth prediction of, for, for the agri, agri sector? Agri sector. Well, if we did 8.4%, I would expect that we would do at least around the same, uh, or because of the weather, the good favorable weather, we may do, do even better. Are you factoring in the current unique circumstances with input challenges, the Ukraine war, and etc. Yeah. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I'm that saying that. still maintain it? Yeah, I'm saying. Because 8% was yeah, before. 8.4%. No. Well, that was before no. all this no, no. chaos. Eight, eight, no, no, no. Don't forget that we just coming out of COVID-19. COVID. And even that we survived. 2021 is a year after the peak of the COVID. We were able to achieve 8.4 percent. Now you and the shortage started then last mm. year. If you remember, farmers were screaming that uh, they don't have enough. Now the situation of the fertilizer is even worse. Now they, and as a result, they are switching to. But that's what I'm asking. Are you factoring that in, in the, yeah, yeah, in the, into your growth projection? Yes, and I'm also factoring in the fact that farmers are switching to organic fertilizer and are also uh, switching some of their resources into non-fertilizer crops. Mm. like the, the, the tubers and the yams and all those things. It's also food. If, if relative prices between the, is the, the wheat, the, sorry, the, the maize and the maize and the others, and, the, and these uh, forest products, it means that people will switch to that. Mm. In Ghana, we are lucky. We have fallback positions. A lot of these West African countries don't have anything. Mm. You know, they are totally exposed. And that's what we, we fail to appreciate, that... We, government has done enough to ensure that there's this whole uh, uh, backup support for farmers and in good times. As if we did five years ago, that if we didn't do anything uh, dramatic about the farm situation, uh, we'll be in trouble. And that is what is carrying us mm. through the COVID and through this uh, 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 Ukraine war crisis, global crisis. We are not going to go hungry. I can assure the nation that there will be more than enough food. Those who are crying wolf, 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 the same two years ago, COVID, we are going to have a food shortage in 2021. 2021 came and went, and we did 8.4%. And oh, Ukraine, oh, the food, everything is going to be short. Well, I'm saying that we are going to do, if we don't do better, at least we will match last year's performance. Okay. Uh, uh, Dr. Ose Friyakutu, who is a great medicine. Thank you again uh, for joining me uh, for, for PM Express, uh, Doc. Uh, well, enjoy the rest of your evening. I guess we'll wait for the harvest <laughs> to see if uh, his predictions will come to pass. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.